Ah, the shameful history of Big Clive. Big Clive has carny connections. When I was younger, I used to um, work on fairground um, rides and fix the light control systems on them, basically. And a lot of the earlier control systems by other manufacturers were really unreliable. They tended to have a lot of um, circuitry um, that was quite vulnerable to major failure on the triac outputs to the sounds. And when that happened, it would generally backfeed to the low-voltage circuitry and it would blow it up. So I came up with my own systems. And the first system was a success, the second system was a success, and it led to a very modular system called the Unimator system. And this is the Unimator system. So, a brief uh, note about the British and European fairground rides. They traditionally use signage that has a lot of very high-speed animation, and if you watch the signs um, as they fill up and chase Las Vegas style, you'll see that the pattern does not repeat for quite a long time. And the reason for this is that all the data is stored in an EEPROM. An EEPROM is just a block of memory. And there are eight bits of data. So in the case of um, an eight-channel sign, you don't need one EEPROM, but in the case of maybe needing a 12-channel sign, Oh, there goes the phone. In the case of a 12-channel sign, you'd have two EEPROMs, uh, giving a total of 16 channels available. So, um, all that really happens in these controllers, they're very simple, they're not computerised at all. And my Capricorn controller here, it, and, and indeed the, the Aquarius controller, um, the clock source, the, the EEPROM data is actually chased sequentially. It starts at address zero, and there's a 4040 binary counter that just basically just, just churns through every single address in that memory space. And the 4040 is clocked by a chip. Now, uh, in, the, in my case, I used a 4093 because it doubled up not just as a clock generator, but as a reset chip. And uh, I'm not sure if I had any other functions in that. Hmm. But um, that's really fundamental. It. Variable speed by changing the timing circuit involving a capacitor and um, a, a limiting resistor. The clock generator, the binary counter, the EEPROM, and then in my case, I used a um, <coughs> hexadecimal switch. It's missing from this board because it's one of the most expensive components, but it's, a, it's one of these little switches here. And it lets you choose one of 16 positions and just puts out a 4-bit binary code. And that was used in this case to select from 16 program banks uh, so that the same card and the same EEPROM could be used for lots of different applications. The data output from the EEPROM was buffered through a ULN2803 and then put out to two standard telecommunications style sockets um, just to make it easier to use a nice robust interconnecting system. The programs that were stored in this particular model were uh, the channel, if you set it to program position zero, it would do a wiring test and diagnostics. And basically speaking, each channel, like channel three, would flash three times, channel eight would flash eight times. It would just repeat that pattern continually. So if you had miswired something in a sign or a border, you could just look at uh, a light and you could instantly tell which channel it was connected to. It was actually very useful. The other programs in that were five, six, seven, and eight letter signage and uh, effects programs, three, four, six, and eight channel borders, and then some more specialized border effects, including 50 50 mixes. The reason for the 50 50 uh, mixes was um, if you sometimes, if you've got a um, fairly close power generator to the for the fairground ride, they don't want too many of the lights coming on and off simultaneously. So with a 50-50 chase, um, there's always exactly the same number of lamps on, but you get loads of different chasing effects, but it, do it means the generator doesn't keep racing and uh, the automatic voltage regulation of the generator doesn't keep ramping it up and down. Now, the power card I designed is opto-isolated. Uh, most of my designs are opto-isolated. Um, just because it makes things more robust. And same telecommunications connector. The, this would do channel 1 to 4, um, and that would do channel 5 to 8. 
you could loop it in and out. So if you had a three-phase supply, if you wanted to divide it across three phases, you could um, by uh, looping it in here, looping it to another card would be in a different phase and then looping it again to another card on a different phase. So they were stackable. Alternatively, if I recall correctly, you could just plug it into either of these. It didn't really matter which one it plugged in. They're just basically wired in parallel to loop through anyway. The triax I chose were BTA 26600Bs or BTA 26600BWs, which have an isolated tab and are very beefy. They're rated about 25 amps. And um, the mounting system I used, it evolved to this really neat arrangement whereby the heatsink had a fin and the fin got sandwiched between the triax and the circuit board. The circuit board had the fixings in, so all you needed in the heatsink fin were th four holes and you sat this underneath the, if this was the heatsink, you sat this underneath the heatsink, um, lined the holes up and then you placed the triax loosely into these rising clamp terminals and then you put uh, the captive hardware down to lock the uh, triax in position with heatsink compound, obviously, and then you tighten these terminals up. I chose rising clamp terminals because these were really quite expensive and good quality ones. Exactly the same ones, I have to say, that I use on my modern RGB controllers because I hate these little printed circuit board terminals that you screw them down and the little metal plate squishes down and then when you try to unscrew it and put another wire in, you can't because the, the metal's all crushed down inside. So these are captive cage rising clamp um, terminal blocks, very good quality, and underneath uh, are anti-tracking slots. You'll also notice that the <coughs> output, because it's fully opto-isolated, you can just tie, uh, each circuit is completely separate, there's no power bus. Power buses are a nightmare on fairground type light controllers because to get the amount of current handling required would require an absolutely huge copper plane. And that causes uh, manufacturing and thermal uh, soldering issues. So I chose to just take the wires directly to the triax, get them as close as possible, big fat tracks, and solder flowed across channels in the tracks, not to beef up the current handling, although it certainly does that, but to actually ensure that in the event of a catastrophic failure in the lighting, um, it didn't blow tracks off the circuit board. It can blow the triac. You can physically blow triacs in half if you get enough of a fault in the output. Um, even with circuit breakers, which is what I tended to use in my systems. I used to use type A or type B 10-amp uh, circuit breakers. But uh, if that happens in other controllers, uh, if the triac blows open, it will often damage things like the opto-isolator oh, and the, the uh, series resistor. I put the opto-isolators in sockets. I would have preferred turn pin sockets, but finding I just couldn't find six pin turn pin sockets from any of my suppliers at that time. Um, and the series resistor I used to the, the gate of the track, I actually used a thermistor with a resistance of approximately 150 ohm as standard. But in the event of a fault, this thermistor will protect it, it it'll actually shut down that circuit um, to protect it. The, on the input side of the opto-isolators, um, the opto-coupled tracks, uh, zero crossing up opto-coupled tracks, I should add, um, that detect the when the mains goes through the zero crossing point to avoid electrical interference. The, there's a resistor from the control side and an LED and then the opto-isolator. Um, all these operate on the unregulated 12 volts from the uh, main controller. And... Um, so there's an LED in series which shows instantly that the opto-isolator is working, well, it shows that it's being triggered. And on the other side, there's a neon indicator and a 220 kilo ohm resistor in series of the neon, and it's across the triac. And when the triac turns on, the neon turns off and vice versa. And it, what that means is that when the system's operating correctly, when the green light's on, the orange light should be off, if it, and vice versa. If the orange light stays off continually, then the neon light, it usually means that the circuit is, there's something, an op, it's gone open circuit, um, or the track has failed and gone dead short circuit, so it's very handy for diagnosing faults. Um, on the card, the main transformer, an expensive transformer, I deliberately chose um, a good beefy transformer that could be screwed down from the underside. Uh, 
because one of the biggest problems with the rough vibration of fairground ride equipment is that it can actually crack the solder joints. So big pads and good hardware to screw the transformer down. Uh, you'll notice there's no fusing input. The, uh, there was a control fuse in the, the uh, control systems, but also these uh, transformers uh, have a built-in PTC thermistor. And technically speaking, the, I believe these ones are short circuit uh, rated, but they also have a fuse in the output um, for protection. Um, the 5 volt regulator feeds this circuitry. It doesn't really draw that much current because it's all pretty much CMOS. And the 9 volt transformer gets rectified, smoothed uh, to provide the supply to the regulator, but also to it feeds the outputs directly via the ULN2803, our Darlington driver, so that um, it doesn't put extra load on the um, regulator. And it's typically around about, it's, it's full wave rectified and smoothed 9 volts, so it comes up to around about 12 volts. And um, oh, logo as well, the old logo from the old days. Um, that's really about it. Big beefy tracks. It's notable that I did connect the positive, the common positive, to the protection diode pin on the ULN2803 and this allows it to drive other things as well. You can drive things like solenoids or relays with it. This was the Big Daddy. Uh, this, while that one could hold 16 programs, this didn't. Uh, each of those programs was 4,096 steps long. This one just holds one program across its EEPROMs of 8,192 steps long. And trust me when I say that programming these for signage was an absolute nightmare. Um, I, I had to custom write my own software, which originally ran on a, a Sinclair QL. And I wasn't the only person in the fairground industry who used a Sinclair QL for editing the programs. Uh, so that was originally written in QL Super Basic, and then latterly I ended up rewriting it for a PC. And I'm trying to think what I, I, I had a little hand controlled puck that went into the PC, or was that the QL? I'm trying to remember now. I had a dedicated hand controlled puck which may have been tapped into a keyboard and allowed me to, uh, it had a menu for different programming functions on the puck. But it also had a wee toggle that let you very quickly click up, on, off, on, off, on, off, and determine which, you know, if you clicked it three times up the way, that was the equivalent of three lights being on in a row, and down the way would be a, a light off in a row, and you could just hammer data in really quickly. <clears throat> but the software, it turns out my software, which was really, it was the latterly written in uh, QuickBasic and on, on running under DOS, it turns out that it wasn't the best approach. I found out later that another fairground uh, <coughs> ride man lighting manufacturer was using a different system. They simply used a text file that they edited uh, the program as a series of characters in the text file, which meant they could copy and paste. I could do multiple block copies in mine, but it was all um, dedicated, written into the software. With the, I really like the idea of the text editor because you could then go back and you could shift things down and you could add characters in. I could only do that with mine if I actually did hard basic commands or just put extra lines into it and, and manual commands that would inject into the program after it's set variables. Not very user-friendly at all. But um, what the other guys did, they once they'd programmed it in a text editor, they'd then run the file, the text file, through their own software, which would then convert it to the EEPROM file format. But writing these programs just took hours. It was just demoralising, I have to say, because quite often you'd have a couple of boxes on one controller, or you might have a border, or you might have a matrix whereby the lights could chase backwards and forwards and then up and down or swirl in the inside, and it was just very time-consuming. Not enjoyable at all. But fundamentally, this is uh, just a scaled-up version of the, the Capricorn. And... Uh, all the EEPROMs are just bust, and then it just puts out 24 uh, channels of data. In this case, because it's driving more of the power cards, it uses a bigger transformer, it uses a bigger rectifier, two capacitors in parallel, uh, then a big power bus going along to the end there, and uh, a, seven, a larger 7805 regulator. 
Again, in all these um, designs, I've got a power light. It's really handy having a power indicator light for just instant, at-a-glance diagnostics. I strongly recommend whenever you design anything, put an indicator light on it to show that power is present. These days, when I get uh, light controllers for repair, I still repair other people's controllers. I never get my own for repair because, to be quite honest, they don't break down. It sounds a bit pompous to say that, but they really are very reliable. And I made everything modular. You can unplug this card not just at the level of unplugging the data connectors, but you can actually... It, each of these cards went out with eight tails in it. It would be... Uh, brown, red, orange and yellow tails appear. Didn't matter which way around the connections went. And after a lot of debate and working out which was the best connector, I chose bullet crimps as the best connector. I'm just going to get a pack and show you this. Bullet crimps. Um, these crimps uh, just push together and I put the, the, on the main side I put the socket crimps and on the controller side I put the, bullet, the actual exposed bullet crimps because when you push these together they make an absolutely superb really high current electrical connection. Uh, they're very easy to terminate, they're very easy to connect. They are rated for mains voltage and uh, they just basically tuck underneath and into the uh, the slotted trunky in the control panels. So when you actually undid the triax, undid the connectors and lifted it up, you could then just unplug it inside with the power off, obviously, just as a safety precaution anyway. But um, that turned out to be a really good connection system. Now, the other cards that I get back, these days, I know that my EEPROMs have been copied which is annoying because so much programming time went into these programs and I know that people have basically read them in and copied them and used them in their own products, which is annoying, but what can you do? These days, I use microcontrollers. That's predictable. This is a little um, get-me-out-a-hole card that I use in other people's shitty blow-up controllers so that when they've uh, done what they often do, and I get this box brought in that smells distinctly sooty and it's usually got triax mounted on an aluminium fin with wires going down onto a circuit board and it's a really common controller in the British fairground industry and when it fails it tends to explode in flames all the tracks just go boom because mains just goes straight through all the logic circuitry that's why I put opto isolation in ooh, can I just point out anti-tracking slots on here as well in between the uh, pins of the opto isolator, lots of anti-tracking slots because they're really important on, on industrial equipment that gets abused. Um, but in the case of these, this is a little roughed up card I did, um, which basically has the output stage of this card, but just with loose wires, so it can actually be tacked onto a board, it can be powered off the existing transformer, which was often loose in the other, uh, other manufacturer's control systems, that comes on, it's got a bridge rectifier, regulator, smoothing, and a microcontroller. And this was a simple four channel version. I also did a 12 channel version. <clears throat> and uh, it basically went in and replaced all the control circuitry completely and just went to the existing hardwired triax um, and used the um, PTC thermistors on the output for protection again to avoid any more explosive disasters. So that's. Um, that's uh, I think microcontrollers are the way to go ahead in this. Although I do have to say, I don't like it getting in some of the Chinese or Dutch control systems that are microcontroller based. And if the microcontroller's failed, you're gubbed, particularly if the company's no longer about, because the, the companies tend to come and go in that industry because it's so specialised. But um, <clears throat> that's where the EEPROM is an advantage, particularly if it's a standardised EEPROM. You can just find another piece of equipment, copy the EEPROM out, and then put it, replace it in to get the original equipment up and going again. But, um, yeah, microcontrollers, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting and much cheaper and more compact option. But there you go, the dark side of Big Clive, Carney at heart. <laughs>